Welcome, welcome all to this episode of the Why to How podcast, where we explore adventures in STEM. After an amazing Canada-wide science fair a few months ago, I wanted to check in with our Platinum and Best Project Award winners to learn about their science fair projects and the adventures they've had along the way. Today, I'm joined by Coral and Lewis, seniors from York Region and our Senior Platinum Award Innovation winners at Canada-wide Science Fair 2022 for their project, Foresight. Analysis of Cancerous Genetic Profiles with Artificial Neural Networks. They also just recently won the second prize for their project at this year's European Union Contest for Young Scientists. So, Coral, Lewis, welcome to the podcast. Woo! Thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Uh, did you want to start us off by introducing yourself a bit and briefly explaining what your project was about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll go first. My name is Lewis. Um, I am a grade 12 senior in uh, St. Robert Catholic High School, and uh, I'll leave it next to Coral. Yep. Uh, I'm also from St. Robert, grade 12 also, and I'm Coral. So our project is um, an AI program that takes in genetic data from uh, blood samples. So you take a blood sample, you put it in a lab, it turns around, does its own thing. And then once it pumps out the data, you can put it into our program. And our program produces a diagnosis on what type of cancer um, that patient has. Cool. All righty. I mean, very cool project. Excited to get into it more. Uh, Coral, maybe do you want to ask, uh, do you want to start us off by letting us know where this idea came from and how did you, how did you come to decide on this being your project together? All right. Uh, our idea actually came from Lewis. He was doing an essay competition. So, cool. Lewis... <laughs> Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Switch it over. Uh, yeah, yeah. So like I started off with the first part of the project. So I was writing an essay contest for this um, American Society of Human Genomics, and I was looking at some images of these genetic tests because these genetic tests they generate images of what um, each genetic sample, how they measure it. That's the test. It's an image. I was looking at it and I was thinking, is there some pattern that occurs between each type of genetic disease that uh, might be able to be recognized. I obviously couldn't recognize anything, right? They're just flickering green and red lights. But I knew Coral was an AI expert, so I left it next to him. Yep. Then I applied an artificial neural network algorithm on it and built an AI. <laughs> cool. Uh, was this like something you just sort of discussed at school? How did you How did you come to be partners in this? Uh, obviously we're in the same grade and we were also friends. Mm -hmm. So Lewis came up to me with the idea of combining, uh, genetic sequencing and artificial intelligence. And that's pretty much where we got started. Yeah. Nice and simple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. is there any reason you like decided on this idea specifically? I'm sure there's, there's lots of different ways that you could have, you could have gone with this project. So how did you settle on like this, this very specific project? Yeah, we actually had a lot of discussions about how to actually do the, we almost abandoned the idea entirely because we couldn't find the correct data for it. But um, one night we thought, okay, this is probably the coolest idea we're going to have. We thought of like analyzing different paintings or pictures by schizophrenic patients to see if we could diagnose schizophrenia. But those ideas seemed super abstract and a lot of the other ideas were way overdone. So we thought this is one original idea we have. We're also greatly affected by it, right? Uh, both of us had relatives that um, have cancer as well. So we thought, why not? Let's push it all the way through. So we stayed up until like 6 a.m. in the morning. We tried to figure out how to um, play around with the very, very old data set website that we were really trying to focus on. And eventually we found the data and uh, we had to focus on this project. So it was close. We almost, we almost abandoned the whole thing. But luckily mm -hmm. for yeah. us, we kept with it. Yeah, luckily, luckily indeed. Uh, and I imagine, yeah, having something that is so close to home, you know, with both family members, it made, made it easy for you to keep, keep going, especially, I'm sure we'll get to it in a bit, through some of the challenges you no doubt had, especially with such an old data set model and then all the challenges that come with AI. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a couple of questions from Thomas and our Discord community. There's lots of, lots of questions, especially about AI and using AI. So maybe uh, Coral, as the AI expert here, did you want to talk to us a little bit about how long it took you to learn the models and how to use AI, uh, and what would you recommend to someone that's wanting to get started with AI modeling? All right. Uh, well, 
I believe in grade eight, uh, I developed this passion in AI uh, thanks to one of my friends, Ian, who introduced me to uh, machine learning. And then in a couple of years, uh, I got back to it and decided to learn artificial neural networks and learn the forward propagation, back propagation, uh, all of the calculus behind it. And also I had to learn uh, TensorFlow and different libraries to uh, implement the artificial intelligence models because otherwise it would take too long. And yeah, that's how I got into learning artificial intelligence. And so for someone who hasn't done anything with AI yet, how, how do you get started? Where did you, where did you pick up this information? Where did you like, is there online courses? What sort of resources do you recommend for someone just wanting to get started? Well, um, I personally began, uh, with looking at a three blue, one brown video. Uh, he has a series yeah. on, uh, artificial neural networks. Uh, I believe it's like three or four videos, but it's pretty amazing. And, uh, he explains, uh, it pretty well using images and, um, yeah, pretty much. So what you're so saying is go down the YouTube rabbit system. hole? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. uh, if you start with just using libraries uh, and not really knowing what's going on on the background, uh, it's hard to uh, know how to improve your models and how to increase its accuracy. So learning the, um, the math behind it and all, uh, that's probably the way to start. Yeah, having that holistic view of all the different ways it interacts with both itself and with, with different models, with different data sets. That way you can break out of following a step-by-step -step process you yeah. might find on Stack Overflow or something, you know, and then actually breaking it out and, and customizing, you know, for, for your own needs. Uh, Lewis, I imagine you also had to learn a whole lot as well. <laughs> uh, not just AI, but uh, just a bunch of information that I can't imagine you're, you're picking up in your, your, your typical high school science class. <laughs> where, mm -hmm. where did you learn all of this information? How did, how did you keep track of all of it? Well, um, I am going down the biology medical sciences pathway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the knowledge was, well, it came along with all the teachers, but there was obviously that's not enough for a science fair project, right? You need to do a lot more digging on your own. So it started off with just, um, we were learning about genetics at school. And I was pretty interested. That's why actually I went to do the essay contest because I was really fascinated by the idea. But when I tried to start digging for like a specific topic to look for, it was really, really difficult, right? Because when you don't have a goal in mind, but you're trying to do something cool, it's like you're going to look everywhere, but nothing's going to actually come together, right? So mm -hmm. I let my mind just sit for a while. And just like Coral, I was looking through YouTube, all of that. And eventually I just said, forget about the science. For, I'm just going to learn my own thing go through YouTube, do what I like with biology, go back to what interested me in the first place. And eventually, because there's a lot of articles online, right? There's a lot of YouTube videos that talk about biology, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Dawkins, all these uh, amazing science communicators. They really inspire the ideas within you. So unlike Coral, Coral obviously, uh, what he did was math, right? Calculus, there were mm -hmm. some people explaining it. For biology, nobody tells you what the next problem is, right? You have to go look at, look at it for yourself. So I guess for both of us, it was just doing what we were interested in. And then eventually we, we stumbled upon a great idea that uh, we could try to build upon. And so was there a certain point in time then that you realized this is going to be better if it's a partner project as opposed to trying to do your own thing on your own? Yeah, definitely. Uh, since uh, I didn't know too much about biology, even though I was interested in it, and Lewis didn't know too much about um, artificial intelligence, uh, we definitely had to partner up to uh, make our project possible. But um, yeah, I think we yeah. started mm -hmm. off uh, as a team, as opposed to mm -hmm. uh, Lewis maybe uh, just writing his essay competitions. Uh, so uh, I think we started off uh, as a partner project already. Definitely. So yeah. I, really I was talking point. to Coral before the essay contest as well. I was talking about ideas because he had done the science fair the previous year and he got silver mm -hmm. medal for, um, an AI diagnosis program for histopathological images, right? Like cancer images hey. of, of skin. Yeah. Right. Was, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, pretty, that's a good, that's a good friend right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so I knew that Coral was interested in biology as well, right? Because otherwise, why would you, why would you choose a topic like that? So I knew he was interested in biology, but I also knew that I was a, 
I was pretty interested in programming in general. I took a Java course a while ago, and um, I knew I wanted to do something with biotechnology, something with coding. So I knew that our interests aligned pretty well, but we weren't masters of both. So we just put our skill sets together and uh, we formed a pretty, pretty, pretty good team. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say you formed a pretty good team indeed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> congrats. <laughs> Um, do you want to talk us, talk us through a little bit? I know this is a question from Prab in the uh, in the Discord chat. How long did it take you to complete your project? So you know you had this idea kind of at the essay writing competition. So when was that? And then how did that idea sort of change? And what sort of timelines are we talking here between how long did you research the idea to then how long did you spend you know coming up with the projects and then how long it actually took you to build it out to something with a conclusion? I don't um, necessarily remember when the essay competition was. I'll try to dig through my skills. memory because I think both of us were like, working with a lot of schoolwork in mind as well and rarely any mm -hmm. sleep. Yeah. But um, not too much of the lack of sleep was due to the science fair, but uh, let's see. So we started off obviously just discussing ideas. That took maybe a month or two, but it wasn't like we had a meeting scheduled every Monday so from like five to yeah. seven just – to brainstorm it's whatever was on our minds we just chatted for like 10 minutes at school if we saw each other in the halls oh i have this idea i'll share it with coral if coral had this idea for how to improve uh his project from last year he would share it with me so that took a month so like you can't really force this process mm -hmm. of just finding an idea right it's it's inspiration but after we had this idea of after i wrote the essay contest i had this idea and just finding the resources to start the project, that probably was what was most time consuming or tedious. Um, as I mentioned, the database we were trying to use, we actually stumbled across it quite early in our, in our, in our research. Um, but that website's probably like 20 years old, at least 15 years old. And I don't think they've updated it at all. And I kept telling Coral, look through this website, look through this website, f figure out how to get the data from it. And Coral, he had a headache looking at the website. And I can completely understand because it was so old. I told him, look look at the Python, look at all the commands. He's like, no, I'm not going to. It's going to take too long. And um, mm -hmm. that probably took us two or three weeks of just talking back and forth, trying to figure out how to extract the data. But then um, the last night, as I said, we were about to abandon the idea. We said, okay, we'll give this one last shot. We both stayed up pretty late. And eventually it was just like a, like a link at the bottom of each research project that we had to click on and it was like compressed or something. So because the original file was like Chinese characters and Japanese characters and there was like a bit of Hebrew in there as well. It looked super weird to us because it was compressed. We just had to put it through like one app and all the data just appeared, popped out. And so it wasn't that, <laughs> it, it wasn't that hard of a problem, but figuring out these little tedious obstacles in the beginning parts of the project, that took the most time. And then from there, maybe two or three months, every week we worked on it for maybe like two or three hours whenever we had an idea, but that was the fun part. So if you're thinking it's gonna be a big time consuming task, once you get past the, the first part, the second part of the project is all gonna be fun. It's not gonna feel like time at all. Yeah, well, once you get through the innovation side of things, the actual, <laughs> actually doing the project can be quite fun. Uh, what was the website that you're using, by the way? Uh, the gene expression omnibus. So mm -hmm. it's held by um, the NCBI and okay. it holds a bunch of genetic data. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, some of the data is a little bit messy since it's like 20 years old. And yeah. we had to compile uh, together, I believe, like eight or 10 of these uh, massive data sets into one massive data set. And yeah, so we use the geo database for the most part. Cool. Yeah, we that was a question tried... we got from, from Tesco. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. We also, uh, this might also be, come in handy, uh, Kaggle mm -hmm. is another website that we searched through. Uh, we weren't able to find any large enough data sets. Or most of them were 500, maybe 5,000 images, or sorry, uh, genetic samples, and that's not really enough for a project like this. So Gene Expression Omnibus, I would recommend it. It's called cool. Geo cool. and... for short. Geo for short. Is that so? Obviously, you would have had to check a bunch of different databases. What, how did you know if something was worth your time? How did you know if you were going to spend time trying to translate, you know, Hebrew and Chinese characters <laughs> into something that might be worthwhile? Like, what, what sort of, 
I don't know, boundaries or constraints or green flags where you're looking for as, as you're going through these different databases and trying to find that information? Well, uh, honestly, uh, two of our biggest concerns were the amount of data and the quality of the data. So for the quality, uh, we had to see if the data was labeled properly, if if it had multiple different classes, if it had um, missing samples for some of the uh, data. And uh, that was our main concern. And our second biggest concern was how many samples did this data set have? So if it didn't have over uh, 100 uh, samples, that wouldn't be a good uh, place to compile our data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's a big project. It's very data heavy. So, uh, you know, AI, yeah. AI isn't something that you can simply just sort of wing, <laughs> wing it. So uh, making sure that data all makes sense, making sure it's all cleaned up and it's actually useful must be a, must be a huge task. I'm not jealous of that, not jealous yeah. of you at all for that. <laughs> Um, yeah. Did you have any sort? Of, did you have any people you turned to support throughout this process? Like, did you have any mentors? Did you reach out to anyone to to give your hand along the way? Mm -hmm. I was just about to add on to what Coral said. Um, we actually went to our biology teacher. Um, mm -hmm. She didn't know what the heck we were doing, but she <laughs> had a brother who um, worked with the microarray chips, these genetic tests that we were focusing on. He he worked with them in a lab, and he knew how to read the data. So he told us what each number on the test actually meant. And that was really helpful because we probably spent a week just trying to figure out what those numbers were. We, we thought we could just throw the numbers into the AI and it would work, but no, we had to normalize it a bit more. So um, talking with our biology teacher, looking for just a few people to clear up some random questions we had, that definitely helped us filter through um, the first uh, random stages of looking for data online and um, yeah just talking to people you're familiar with and a lot of our other chemistry biology teachers they were like soundboards for us they were willing to listen to our projects because um, they were really interested so just being able to chat with someone even if they don't have the really in-depth knowledge that's just going to give you um, all your next steps to your projects just talk to people that's always helpful yep definitely yeah. We also, uh, oh, yeah, go for it. Sorry. Uh, we also uh, had some help from uh, Team York, uh, which was, um, yeah, which is where we went to the Canada wide uh, science fair from. And they helped us uh, sort of review our presentation, go over uh, how we should uh, explain our topic. And that was extremely helpful as well. So even if someone isn't specialized uh, in your a topic, uh, it's very useful to have a bunch of people to talk to and get help from. Yeah, science fair projects, it's not always just about the actual science itself. It's also about how you present it and, and you know, how to make sure that you're including the right information, how you're talking about it, how you're telling that whole, whole big story. So, yeah, I mean, I always like to say that you can learn something from anyone. You just have to find that that key little piece that they can, they can offer you. So, um, yeah, great advice. Fantastic. So, did all of this work, normalize all the data, run it through the AI. What did you discover? Talk to me a little bit about your conclusion and why this is important for us and the world. Well, uh, our AI reached 95% accuracy. And um, other than that, we also found a couple of uh, genes that could uh, act as biomarkers for cancer, different cancer conditions. And yeah, Lewis, if you would... Like to take on. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the basic implication of our project being so accurate is the fact that within these genetic tests, there is a pattern that the AI can recognize, right? So one that says um, throughout the 2,500 genes we analyzed, there's some pretty complex patterns inside those genes that um, are indicative of uh, certain cancer conditions. And the second thing is AIs can actually find those patterns when they're Whereas uh, a human eye, no, no chance, no shot, right? There's no chance that um, you're going to see a pattern within 2,500 genes and only like 300 of them, 300 of them randomly dispersed throughout um, have some slight indication that um, this patient might have uh, some uh, proclivity to, 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 be, um, to develop some sort of cancer in the future. So those are the two main things. And as Coral said, um, we did a little data analysis part separate part of our project that wasn't specifically related to AI, 
But um, we found a few genes that were um, expressed at different levels. So their values were higher, much higher or much lower. And that, um, that, that could be useful for future, future research as well. And so 95% doesn't mean it sounds impressive. Doesn't mean anything to me. I know nothing about AI. So how do you know that 95% is a good benchmark? How do you even, how do you track that 95% and how do you then talk about it to people so they understand? Yeah, you did something pretty cool. All right. Uh, so in our data set, we had, I believe, at least 20,000, uh, maybe 30,000 uh, samples. And we split this data set. Uh, we allocated, I believe, 10% of it uh, to testing. And uh, we ran our AI through the, after training the AI, we tested it with this 10% of the data set. And uh, we found out that it was able to accurately guess 95% of the images correctly. So uh, that's what I meant by 95% accuracy. And this is a pretty good benchmark because usually uh, I'm pretty sure diagnoses like this, uh, they're usually around the 85% uh, accuracy uh, range, uh, I believe. I would have to do more research on that as of now, but uh, it's a pretty uh, big difference. Yeah, the numbers inside my head, um, traditional diagnosis methods are around 80%, so like MRI scans. Um, biopsy yeah. surgeries even those are kind of dangerous it's around 80 percent our project so if you give it a data of a patient who has um gastric cancer 95 percent of the time it would guess correctly and for all the other conditions as well and that's kind of a big deal when mris and surgery cost so much money it's <laughs> yeah, i can imagine mm -hmm. this ai is far cheaper than that especially when you when you start to scale it up right definitely yeah. definitely yeah. Uh, I can't imagine you got to 95% just first go. Were there a few different challenges along the way? Did you have a, a few things not go correctly for you? Uh, well, uh, knowing a bit about AI, uh, I knew that I would have to uh, play around with the model to make it uh, better. So um, I decided to use uh, a, I pretty much use natural selection. If you sort of think about it, I ran 25 uh, AI models against each other with uh, initially randomized parameters. And then um, I chose the one that has the highest accuracy. And in the end, we had like 90 players and a bunch of other parameters that were specialized for the task of uh, genetic sample classification. So yeah, it definitely takes a long time to get the AI used to the specific data. Mm -hmm. Man, AI just sounds magical to me. <laughs> it's like you two are wizards. <laughs> uh, how did you keep going? I mean, um, I imagine uh, running all of those tests and you're spending all that time normalizing data. I imagine there were a few points in time where you're both like, oh, let's just call it. <laughs> this, is, this is too hard. How, how did you how did you keep going? Um, well, as um, I mentioned, there, there was one stage in our project where we thought that's just abandon it, but that was in the beginning. Um, I would think later on, we didn't think of saying, let's just uh, stop the project here and just not keep going. It was always, let's just stop here and not improve anymore, right? It was something mm -hmm. like that, where it was maybe 90% accurate and we thought, okay, it's fine. Uh, even though sometimes we knew there was probably one or two problems with the AI that we could have fixed or one or two um same things we were uncertain about that we thought the data probably has a mistake here that makes the AI more inclined to make this prediction or stuff like that. And we thought, ah, it's, it's good enough. We can submit it for the science fair. They'll, um, the judges will, will, will probably understand that it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good of a project. But um, I think eventually we just got curious, right? We just kept thinking, what if we, we, we added this change? What if we, what if this change actually makes our project more practical? What if it makes it, in the future, able to be used in the in the medical field, right? So, both of us were very motivated to to keep on going. Sometimes, yes, we got lazy, but um, I think I think our momentum carried through after we got past the the first few tedious tedious months. Yeah, I mean, I imagine so, <laughs> and clearly it worked for you both because here you are. Um, did you find that there was any challenges working as a partner? I mean, especially Coral, like you've done a science side project on your own last year. Did you find it? Did you find there was any difficulties in trying to do it as a as a partner project? I mean, I'm not trying to get you to both 
both goss on each other right now, but I'm, you know, group projects are always challenging. So tell me a little bit about how you worked through that process and how you, how you kept being an effective team throughout the whole process. Yeah. So, uh, the biggest problem, uh, in a partner project or a group project is, uh, someone might want to do something, but another person might, uh, disagree and want to take the project on a different path. And, uh, well, to deal with this, we actually just had to talk about it and discuss what would be the best option and uh, look at different factors of science fairs and uh, pretty much just talk about it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that was all we needed to do to uh, determine what what we should do. Yeah, uh, other than that, we didn't have, we also had one more challenge. Uh, since Lewis didn't really uh, know too much about uh, Python specifically, uh, I had to uh, translate it. And at some <laughs> point that didn't work out too well. So Lewis sort of learned the syntax better and he was able to understand and um, fix even some of my code. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically <laughs> communication is really important. And um, if you're doing a group project, especially, um, try to learn what the other person is actually working on, right? So it's not like they're, they're really excited about one thing they're adding and they explain it to you. And it's like talking to a brick wall. Like, <laughs> I, it's like if I didn't learn anything about AI or anything about the code, um, it'd be pretty boring for Coral, right? If Coral didn't know anything about the biology, it'd be pretty boring for me. So uh, learning from each other a little bit, making the whole um, process of, I do this part, you do that part, making it a bit more connected. I think that that's really important in working in any team, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to be experts in it all. You don't have to have the exact mm -hmm. same knowledge of everything, but at least having enough to understand, uh, I'm sure, made that whole process smoother. And I imagine trust was another big piece, too. Like, especially if you didn't know everything that the other person did, you had to trust that what they were saying was, well, should, should have been, at least, you know, in, in, your, in the group's best interest, for sure. Oh, yeah, the group, yeah. The, 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 the AI's accuracy definitely validated that a bit more. So if I, even if I didn't trust Coral, it was 95% accurate. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Can't lie about computers, right? Um, <laughs> so how, um, how did it feel then when you first got that, you know, that test back and it was like 95% accurate? I mean, that must have felt pretty amazing to know that all of your hard work had paid off. Actually, I was pretty skeptical because 95% <laughs> accuracy Good. is pretty high. <laughs> so um, I actually uh, looked deeper into the AI and used other metrics to see if there was any problem with uh, the accuracy. And some of the minority classes, uh, the samples where we didn't have too much uh, data in, so if we only had like 50 uh, samples of uh, glioma or something like that, then it wouldn't perform the best. So uh then I had to fix this by adding more samples. Uh, Lewis helped a lot with doing research on geo and finding the data sets that we needed. And after that, uh, we were more certain that our AI was actually 95% accurate. So yeah, yeah I was uh, just first excited. Reaction. Um, I was not skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you definitely uh, don't uh, want to. You definitely wouldn't want to trust uh, any AI project instantly. It's always better to mm -hmm. see uh, what's actually going on fully before trusting it. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, yeah. <laughs> what about then when you got the results back, you were watching the awards ceremony and you were both called out as Platinum Award winners. How, how did that feel to you both? What was that, what was that moment like? That was pretty amazing. Actually, we were on call and Lewis was uh, doing his uh, soccer teaching. Uh, he was coaching for a few kids and uh, mm -hmm. I had to announce to him. Uh, uh, yeah, I had to announce everything to him. So that was pretty amazing. And yeah, we were both excited. <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, it was in the second hour of my coaching lesson, right? And it wasn't just a few kids. It was like maybe like 15. It was like in the middle of summer, there were a lot of kids. We were playing a, a match. It was 7v7. These are like eight-year-old kids. So I was like uh, telling them what to do and stuff. I just had that. It was these ear pods actually in my ear. I just had Coral commentating to me. Um, each time we won an award, he was just uh, announced in my ear and I wouldn't be able to say anything because I was talking to the kids. So um, yeah. it was 
it was a weird dynamic there. But um, <laughs> after the lesson was over, after I said bye to the kids, I said thank you to the parents, then it was it was time to get excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so then what was the transition? You've just come back from Europe. What was that transition from Candabad Science Fair to then, you know, presenting it to USIS? And, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about the process yeah. of getting to USIS, what that whole experience was like, what you learned there? Uh, our process was just uh, trying to find even more data. And uh, we also had to solidify uh, some of our statistical analyses to make sure we weren't doing anything wrong. And when we got there, it was a completely different experience because it was in person rather than online. And we actually uh, had to make posters and present uh, our project like in a real life science fair uh, as opposed to an online setting. And the judges were uh, nice as well, uh, similar to the Canada wide. And other than that, um, the city was completely different. So that was an extremely fun experience to um, to travel and also get lost on my way to the <laughs> judging sessions a couple of times. And yeah, uh, arriving 30 minutes late, but still managed <laughs> to do decent or do well. Yeah. So like the transition between Canadian wide and, and Europe, um, obviously after we won our award, we had a lot more credibility, right? So we could reach out to a lot more professors before this, we were just talking to our biology teachers who mm -hmm. just helped us reflect basically. Um, and they helped us, uh, with our, with our talking sessions. Um, but once we got to connect with, some um, some professors, we actually reached out to the original researcher who created the data set for that we were using in Japan. And, um, I, I love Japanese, so um, I've been learning a little bit on Duolingo. So I, I tried to throw in a little bit of Japanese in, in my emails, and that was really exciting. So basically, after the Canadian Wide Science Fair, we had a lot more, um, not really motivation. We always had motivation, but there were many more aspects that we could explore in terms of science research that we were able to um, have access to. And that was really motivating. It kept us going throughout the summer until USIS. Yeah, but it sort of yeah. like renewed your renewed your passion again. All of a sudden, you know, you, you you had received this big accolade, and everyone had acknowledged just how good of a job you'd done. That you were like, oh, let's do more. <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. How how did you go about reaching out to that Japanese researcher? I mean, that must have. I mean, it's still like that's a it's a big deal to reach out to someone literally on the other side of the world and just be like, hey, we used your we used your database, and here's what we did with it. <laughs> Please help. Mm -hmm. I mean, what did you what did you say? What did you talk about? How did he help you out there? Well, luckily the the Japanese are very very nice, as everybody knows. Um, mm -hmm. So I basically um, there was a list of emails on the website, and uh, this one was the top one. She she was the main contact for the project, and um, I reached out to I just popped her an email. I said, "Here's our project. Uh, thank you so much for doing such excellent research on your database." Um, we're hoping that you can give us a little bit of feedback on what do you think, what you think, uh, how do you think our project is doing, um, any concerns that you might have because they created the data, right? So they would know if mm -hmm. um, there was something like obvious in each sample that was giving it away to the AI or something like that. But um, no, she she thought it was a really cool project, and um, eventually I just I started talking about Japanese history with her. Actually, I was shooting a few a few emails back and forth with her. But um, I suppose for anybody else thinking about like, oh, how do I contact someone who has a status this high, or is so credible, has done so much incredible research? Um, most of the time, adults are pretty willing to help out, um, help out students, right? Especially if they have an interesting idea or especially if they seem very curious. And uh, it's, it's important not to think of them as like um, some deity up there that's controlling the science world. And if you contact with them you're you're you're, all, you're like blessed or something and you're gonna have a amazing um, amazing future ahead of you or something like that no it's just shoot an email or two uh, at some people that you're interested in chatting with and um there's a lot of things that can come of that just uh taking that chance mm -hmm. so earlier i was talking to annabelle uh, about her useless experience she says hi by the way <laughs> so, so it was absolutely oh, unreal unreal couple of days with you all um and she mentioned that the judging was quite conversationalist when you were when you were there and use this. Did that present any challenges to you? I mean, were there any questions that really stood out to you as as something pretty pretty spectacular from the judges? Something you weren't expecting? 
Mm, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> Not <Anything> specific. <laughs> well, uh, some, the judges were very nice, uh, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, can't, I can't think of too many things. Well, what, one thing that I thought, because they actually put us, well, yeah, our project is part of the medical section, right? The health section. So um, we didn't actually get that many AI experts or computer science experts that were um, there to judge yeah. how our program was created. But um, we got a lot of like, biotech, bioinformaticians, so people that analyze these medical mm -hmm. data and a lot of medical professionals. So a lot of their questions were about uh, what concerns do you have about the data that you're actually using? What are the practical um, elements of your project? And I remember the first judge that we got, he, he came in, he was this giant Slovakian man, I think, and he had, this, he had these tiny glasses and a big beard, and he just... He had this little booklet that he was holding in, in front of his hand, and he just looked absolutely unconvinced by our project. From the moment he walked in front of our poster, he did not look convinced. And he kept on asking us, like, oh, why do you think, uh, what do you think are the factors affecting cancer? And we gave, like, 10, dan 10 answers, probably. And he says, no, no, no. He kept saying no. And then eventually I, I caught on. I was really slow that day. It was the first judging session, so I wasn't expecting anything. And... Um, eventually I caught on and he, he, the answer he wanted was there are no specific factors, right? Um, so a lot of these judges, they were really skeptical. Um, so they questioned us about many things that we weren't considering for our project. So like, is the data actually trustworthy? Um, mm -hmm. can you just look at genetics for, for, um, diagnosing cancer and stuff like that? And I think that was the biggest difference from the Canadian wide judges who maybe asked us about our AI a bit more. These judges really wanted us to consider our project in a more holistic way in, in a way that would, in the way that we probably overlooked, um, uh, we shouldn't have overlooked uh, when we were developing our project of, is the data actually reliable? Is, um, is there maybe factors affecting our data that um, might have make, made our project uh, seem more impressive than it actually is in the real world or stuff like that. But that was really helpful for us to reconsider um, in the direction we were taking our project and where we should go in the future. Yeah, just those very foundational steps. And, you know, again, that holistic view of something, I think, especially when you spend so many months in something very specific, like a <laughs> scientific research uh, process, you can like get those blinkers on a little bit. So just making sure you, you take that time to step back at some point and just be like, we've put so much effort in, like, we, we're making sure we're on the right track. We're not just sprinting as fast as we can in one direction. We want to make sure we're actually still on the track. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice then for how to present yourselves well to judges? I mean, it doesn't have to be specifically for users, but you can just present yourself to any judge that you might come across at a regional science fair or at a national science fair, international. Lois would have to answer this one. I'm not the best at uh, <laughs> presenting personally. <laughs> I would say that I think Coral was uh, was really good at explaining the like AI parts, but I think they expected mm -hmm. that from someone who was more focused on coding. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. no no offense to Coral, obviously, <laughs> but um, I was I think the biggest thing that I tried to do was I tried to make it like a conversation, right? They don't want to see um, all like a like a like a mask, the facade that you put on, where you try to be this. Uh, a respected old professor that's done all his research in a project, they know that you're a kid, right? They, and they know that you obviously haven't done as much research as them. It's impossible, right? They, they have years of, ex decades more experience than you do, right? So they, they understand that. You don't have to put on a face where uh, you have to try to be like the stoic old scientist who's considered all the ethical concerns of your project. No, you don't have to be like that. Um, you can, because what they want to see is they want to see some curiosity in you, right? They want to see that, you're actually passionate about your project. You're not doing it just for the awards. Um, so when having like a judging session with uh, the judges, um, try to make yourself seem like a student, right? They want to see that you're a student with a lot of potential. They don't want to see that uh, you're putting on a mask for them or a facade for them. So just talking about uh, the projects, the parts of the project that made you most excited, having some excitement in your voice, you don't have to force that, right? 
you made this project, you worked on it for a long time, you know what you're passionate about. And don't be afraid of going on like a rambling session about something. Um, whatever you think is the most important part of your project, talk about that a lot and talk about it with a lot of passion. Don't be afraid of misstepping because they're not looking for a perfect like symposium on your project. You're not presenting it to the Nobel committee, right? You're presenting it to um, a judge who's, who's looking to see if you're a student who has a creative idea and who wants to take it further in the future, right? Because like nobody actually, no, nobody expects your project to be the next big thing, the next thing that Johnson and Johnson purchases and uh, incorporates in, into their new vaccine program or something like that. And uh, they just want to see that you want to make something, you want to make a change, and you're interested in making science a part of that. So don't be afraid of um, of all of the, the 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 ghosts inside of your head. Just present it as something you're very very interested in. Just think of the project as your personal project. That's my best advice. Yes, that, great, great advice, great advice. Love that, love that. Uh, clearly, I mean, clearly you both love this. Like you love scientific mm -hmm. research. That's why That's why you're learning coding in your spare time. Lewis, that's why you're learning biology in your spare time. That's why you did the science fair project in the first place. I mean, where did this passion come from? Why, why, why are you doing a science fair project? Why is it important? Coral, I talked for so long. I can long, see you thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's even um, wearing a bright young mindset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's from uh, Usus. And, yeah. uh, well, uh, I could talk about two different things. So my passion uh, for data science or my passion for just science spheres in general. Uh, but Do it both. I guess I'll yeah. just talk about data science. So uh, personally... <laughs> Uh, I just love programming. It's like a puzzle to me. Um, I like solving pro uh, problems that uh, relate to uh, creating an algorithm or something along those lines. And uh, I got my passion from probably one of my friends in grade seven or grade eight who was also a programmer. So uh, having friends that uh, might be, uh, I suppose, better than you at something or just uh, might have some interests that are uh, also interesting to you, uh, that might be uh, a good, well, that could be a good idea to uh, pursue their uh, field as well, to follow them as well. And for science fairs, it's uh, obviously very important to create innovations so that we can uh, create a change in the world for the better. And that was our main goal with our project, to make a change or to improve uh, cancer diagnoses and it's always important to have a passion for something so that you can make those changes yeah i definitely agree with coral um but i suppose one thing i might add like science research for me um for coral it's it's the coding part of it right it's the puzzles that are in each line of code the small mistakes that can make or break a whole project and like seeing it as a one seeing like a hundred lines of code turn into something that you can actually see the results of, right? See it, see it working. Um, for me with biology, it's a bit more different. Well, I was actually really interested in coding and math um, in my earlier years. Um, I still do a lot of math contests. I do decently on them. I was almost certain that I was going to be a programmer when I grew up, but eventually I saw um, a lot of potential. I was really interested in biology uh, after a while because I, um, I thought that seeing like the inner workings of what's going on in the human body and all the plants that you see around you, every, all the entire environment, um, I thought um, that just made my imagination go off even more than, than the math problems that I saw, the coding problems that I saw, the, the lines of Java code. And it was so much easier for me to... Um, unleash my imagination and imagine different scenarios, different projects, different solutions to these many problems. And I guess for Coral and I, our main motivation for scientific research is it's just so fun. It, it, it allows your thinking to elevate to, to another level, right? It's not just every day I see YouTube, I see TikTok. It's I see a tree or I see one, uh, one problem and I can see a whole world of possibilities that I can maybe take part in as well, right? 
and there's nothing like a STEM project to, to give you some problems, is there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? It's, I mean, it's fun doing, you know, Code Academy or something online and just like answering a quick problem or, you know, in a textbook, just like fixing a problem real quick. But when you do a STEM project, you're facing problems that you didn't even dream could be, could be a problem. I mean, <laughs> who would have thought that you'd spend your weekends trying to find a data set from 25 years ago and trying to figure out how right. to normalize it and make it make sense? Um, yeah, it's just <laughs> something completely different to what you probably would have expected and something completely different to science class. Um, mm-hmm. So just expanding on that just a little bit then, clearly, you know, you both got a lot going on in your lives, as does every every teenage kid. Why should they be spending it doing science fair projects? Why prioritize this? Uh, well, we're both passionate about the project. We, it wasn't really uh, doing a science fair project for us. It was more... Uh, doing something we were passionate about. So this could have been, uh, for me personally, it could have also been like competitive programming or uh, something that's not exactly a science fair, but uh, we were both passionate in uh, genetic sequencing and artificial intelligence. So we decided to use a science fair as a way of uh, pursuing our passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people have this like random excuse that they're too busy to do the science fair project. Um, I suppose a lot of people are just intimidated. They find the idea of science fair project, those two words as like a really daunting prospect where, you know, you have to research all of this, create all of that, present it to all these people. Um, I think the best way to think of starting a science fair project is not to think of it as like a giant project. It's just Think of it as a way to uh, further explore what you're learning in the classroom, right? Because yes, learning about the Krebs cycle and uh, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. That gets pretty (laughs) tedious, right? But seeing some, like looking a little bit further, trying to find some uh, practical or some real world examples of how this data actually relates to you, because science teachers, they can't do that every single class, right? When they're teaching about the cell, they're not going to be able to really convince you that all of this information is directly related to your body, right? No matter how many times they say that, you're not going to feel that personal connection just yet, right? So science fair project, you don't have to call it that, right? Just think of it as an extension of your learning. Try to add upon what you're uh, learning in school. And eventually when you build it enough, when you build that passion for uh, the solid knowledge that you're learning in school and mix it with some more interesting things that you see online, that grows into a science project, right? It doesn't start as a project. You don't have an idea yet. So try to build upon what you're doing in school. So I suppose the best reason to do it is um, because we were pretty busy with schoolwork. It was, it was grade 11, right, bes- right before grade 12, we had to worry about universities. The science fair just kept us motivated about what we're doing. We were working on something that was practical, that we could see working, alongside the practical solid knowledge we're learning in the classroom. And that kept us going. That was like a symbiosis between the two, right? One thing Mm -hmm. kept feeding us knowledge for, for the science fair, the science fair kept giving us motivation to actually learn the stuff that we needed to do to learn. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Great advice. Uh, What comes next for you both? Are you continuing this, this project together? Are you still, still building out the AI? Are you going to do something different? Uh, we might participate in uh, other science fair competitions as well. So maybe ICEF or something along those lines. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we're allowed to do uh, uses twice, uh, but if it's possible, <laughs> we definitely would. And yeah, uh, yeah, we're also thinking of maybe continuing the project uh, as we go into university. It would be more difficult. Uh, we'd have to do everything online. And we, it would be hard to do it in person if Lewis went to a U.S. school or something like that. And yeah, so we're thinking of continuing the project, but it would be it would pose more challenges. Yeah, we're thinking of um, doing as much as we can before we have to go to university and trying to because we're, we're going to do a few more competitions this year with it. But it's not the competitions that we're we're really thinking about. It's just trying to polish our project to make it something we can look back on in the future and say, yeah, we did something pretty incredible when we were in high school. Yeah. And something incredible is exactly what you've done here. 
I mean, congratulations. So congratulations once again. I mean, such a cool project. So I just have one more question for you both then. Super easy, just a nice chill one to end on, but why is STEM important? Oh, there's so many answers to that. Uh, well, uh, STEM leads to innovation. So combining different STEM subjects, um, math, uh, computer science, although well, math science, all of those, combining them together and <laughs> um, creating innovations uh, helps us improve things in the world. So uh, that would probably be the most important part of STEM, the ability to innovate and make changes in the world that would help everyone. And yeah. yeah. So Coral's answer is a bit more specific. I'll give a super abstract answer, right? So what I think for anybody, right? For, for children, for adults, for older people, um, there's two things that you think about uh, in life, right? G generally, the one thing is just pure imagination, right? Just uh, thinking about uh, reading philosophy and having random ideas, uh, reading a novel and having random ideas, imagining um, different, I don't know, make-believe creatures, unicorns, stuff like that. These random thoughts that you can entertain yourselves with in, in your dreams, right? And I think STEM is the other, uh, other way of thinking where you can take your imagination, the same imagination, same imaginative spirit that you have, and imagine things that are actually possible in the world, right? Making your imagination a reality in the world, something you can see, something you can see working, something you can actually tangibly touch or, or, or um, try or see the impacts of what your imagination is doing in other people's lives. And I think it's so important to just enjoy life. Um, one way is obviously taking your imagination to random places and just having fun thoughts. But the other way, which I think is so much more fulfilling is, you know, making your imagination a reality, right? You don't have to keep it inside your head, uh, right? Your mind can be expanded outside of just your body, just your hours alone inside your, your room thinking about random problems. It can be something realistic in the world. And um, I think that's my, motiv my, my main motivation for pursuing all these things. It's just um, allowing my thoughts to be a reality. I think that's that's the most important thing about STEM is it can make your dreams a reality. That sounds like a movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the tagline for a podcast if I've ever had one, jeez. Uh, I, I love the way that you two both interact as well. I mean, like <clears throat> the, the, the difference in perspectives from you both over the last hour you know, where Coral's very much in the weeds and the technicalities and you know, individual lines of codes and the individual problems. And Lewis, you're a lot more like bigger picture. You see the forest instead of the trees sort of guy. Um, I mean, it's fantastic. And I think that's it's definitely worked out well for you both. I think that partnerships needs both to make sure that you're both on, this, on the right track to, to maximize your efficiency uh, and, and to create such a wonderful project that truly does have such um, amazing um, results and and, you know, could potentially be this huge big thing that changes the world. So uh, I just want to thank you both for, for being here today. Any any last pieces of advice for, for everyone listening before we before we sign off? Uh, just pursue your dreams, <laughs> as Lewis mm -hmm. said. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Carl said it for me then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pursue your dreams. <laughs> Do STEM. <laughs> Do a project. Uh, Lewis. Coral, thank you so much for joining us here today. I mean, what a fantastic episode. You know, we've had an hour of absolute fire, just perfect words of wisdom, uh, amazing, you know, words of inspiration. It's fantastic to hear about your experience working as a partner project, how you came up with the idea, um, how you developed that over the couple of months that you did. You know, also your international experience and just hearing about that, which is something not too many students get the, the opportunity to do. Uh, so I can only, once again, on behalf of YSC and everyone in Discord, listening along today uh just congratulate you again for such an amazing project uh everyone here has absolutely loved it Atharama, Prab, Tesco thanks for joining us in discord Lewis Coral good luck for the future hopefully thank you we'll see you again soon no doubt I'll be following you both closely because I just imagine you both just getting started with everything uh keep up the amazing inspiration hopefully everyone listening along continues to reflect on these words of wisdom as they reflect on their own uh, adventures in stem
Yeah, and I actually have one more thing to say just for the people listening or whoever watches this in the future. I hope this interview helps you realize like people who, who win science fairs or have these um, interesting ideas, they aren't like super nerds or uh, very arrogant <laughs> people who, who, who know their IQ is like 180 or something. And I think that's, exp- that's an experience Coral and I had in Europe as well. Where we visited Europe, there were like probably like 80 teams of partners and uh, teams of three. None of them were like super arrogant or really thought that they were the next big thing. They all just wanted to chat with you. They were normal people who yeah. seemed very open. And I think that's the most important thing to take away from this interview is even if you're not um, a super mathematician, even if you're not Einstein, you can make something very, very incredible. And the science fair is an an amazing opportunity to do so. It is truly the best community. (laughs) Everyone's so supportive. Uh, You know, shout out to Discord. Like, come join our come join our Discord server and meet meet friends from across the country, all doing the same things and all sharing the same passion. Because as you say, yeah, we're not (laughs) we're not all super nerds here. I mean. Yeah, we like nerdy things, but we're all just normal people that want to do cool things. And Lewis and Coral, you've exemplified that here today so so clearly. So thank you so very much. And we'll talk to you again soon, no doubt. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you all for joining us in this episode of Why to How, a podcast where we explore adventures in STEM. If you liked this podcast, consider leaving us a like on our social media. It's just ysc.sjc on Facebook and Instagram, YSC underscore SJC on Twitter, or join our Discord. It's Purple STEM Wave. You can find the link on our website, usescience.ca. Please leave us a comment with your favorite part of the interview and let us know your own thoughts on the topics we discussed. And if you liked it, please do share a link to the podcast or YouTube video with friends who you think would love to follow along. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a review as it really does help us reach more people. We'll have another amazing guest for you on the next episode, so stay tuned for more. Until then, have a wonderful day and stay curious.